Hello all and welcome to Mayor Brown's Patent Damages Recent Trends and Analysis Webinar. My name is Brian Owen. I'm an intellectual property partner at Mayor Brown. I focus my practice on patent litigations representing clients and all types of technologies ranging from life sciences to high tech to consumer good matters. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by Vince Thomas and Manuel Velez. Uh, Vince is a Senior Managing Director at FTI Consulting, based in Chicago. Vince specializes in matters involving various types of intellectual property, including patents, trade secrets, trademarks, and copyrights. In that regard, he has analyzed economic and financial issues in hundreds of disputes and has provided expert testimony in state and federal courts across the country, as well as the International Trade Commission. Such testimony has focused on valuation and damages issues in several industries, including computer technology, electronics, telecommunications, retail, manufacturing, and life sciences. Manuel is an intellectual property partner at Mayor Brown, focusing primarily on patent infringement litigation and PTAP proceedings in such areas as pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and medical device. Devices. Uh, today, Manuel and Vince will lead the discussion on recent trends in the analysis of patent damages. Manuel will focus on the legal developments, while Vince will provide the practical applications from his experience as a testifying expert. The discussion will focus on the comparability and apportionment challenges facing experts, patent damages for foreign activities, reliance on licenses post dating the hypothetical negotiation potential impact of proposed amendments to the Federal Rules of Evidence 702. Before uh, we begin, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, I invite you to use uh, to let us know via the chat feature. Simply type your question and we will do our best to address the question. If not addressed by the speakers at the time uh, presented, I will track those questions and at the appropriate time, I will direct them to either Manuel or Vince. Regarding CLE credit, uh, we will provide an alphanumeric code during this presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code and return the CLE form within 10 days of the event to CLE-events at mayorbrown.com. These instructions are also on the form that you received. Uh, now I will turn it over to my colleague Manuel to take us through these topics. Thanks, Brian. In recent years, uh, we have seen a trend where juries are giving out larger damages award in patent cases. Uh, it's not unusual for awards to be in the hundreds of millions, if not even billions of dollars. Uh, in this graph, we're showing the top five damages awards in the last three years. Uh, in 2020, the top two awards exceeded $1 billion. In fact, the top award nearly reached $2 billion. Uh, in 2021, the top damages award exceeded $2 billion. And in 2022, the top damages award nearly reached $1 billion. Uh, taken together, these damages awards show that there's a lot at stake when patent cases go to trial. At the same time that we have seen an increase in the size of damages award given out by juries, we are seeing that the federal circuit is scrutinizing patent damages more closely. Uh, for example, in a single day last year, the federal circuit erased two large patent damages awards because the underlying expert opinion on damages lack factual support. Uh, in the case of Apple v. Weiland, the court vacated a verdict of $85 million. Also in the case of California Institute of Technology v. Broadcom, the court vacated a verdict of $1.1 billion, $1 billion. And this award was the second largest in a patent case in 2020. In both instances, uh, the court remanded the cases for a new damages trial. Given this increased scrutiny by the federal circuit and with so much at stake, it's essential that parties use an appropriate methodology to determine patent damages. Uh, before we dive into recent trends, Vince Thomas, our damages expert, is going to give us a brief overview on patent damages. So I will turn it over to Vince. Okay, thanks Manuel. And I know there are some on the call that are fairly familiar with uh, patent damages, but for those that are not familiar, 
Um, 35 U.S.C. Section 284 is the statute that governs patent damages, and it's something that we, in, as damage experts, look to uh, in determining a measure of damage. So in, in patent cases, uh, measures of damages can include, for example, lost profits. If it's uh, two competitors that are uh, having a dispute, the plaintiff may claim that the defendant's use of the patent uh, caused the plaintiff to lose sales and therefore lose profits. Uh, it may have also caused them to reduce prices or suffer price erosion. Uh, in certain cases, though, it may not be possible to prove those damages or they may not be appropriate at all. For example, in cases involving non-practicing entities that don't sell products, um, lost profits or price erosion wouldn't be appropriate. But the statute guides us in that regard in that in no event will the damages be less than a reasonable royalty for the use made of the invention by the infringer. So at a minimum, in all cases, uh, the plaintiffs are entitled to what's referred to as a reasonable royalty. Now, a, a reasonable royalty uh, is determined under what we, re we refer to as a hypothetical negotiation uh, that occurs between the patent holder and the accused infringer just prior to when the infringement uh, began. So if the, the infringement began 10 years ago, that's when the hypothetical negotiation would take place. And the idea would be that the uh, patent holder and the uh, defendant would sit down negotiate a royalty and the outcome of that negotiation would dictate what that what the damages would be in this situation. Um, now, it is hypothetical and differs from real world negotiations. And in particular, it differs in that, uh, first of all, this isn't a situation where the plaintiff can say it's a take it or leave it proposition. Um, the plaintiff may say, look, I, I, I don't uh, typically license patents. I didn't want to license this patent. So either accept a very large royalty or, or I'll walk away. That, that can't happen in a hypothetical negotiation. The parties must come to a reasonable accommodation that's reflective of the alleged value or the value of the alleged use of the patent. The other difference is that um, all cards are on the table in that in an actual negotiation, the parties typically don't disclose all information uh, but in a hypothetical negotiation, it's assumed that both parties would have access to all relevant information that would be pertinent to assessing the value of the, of the patented invention and what a royalty might be. And this can actually include information that comes after the hypothetical negotiation date. And we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, in the presentation. Now, the factors that are considered in a hypothetical negotiation are actually fairly consistent with what would typically be considered in an, in an actual negotiation. And they're, they're referred to in this context as the Georgia Pacific factors. And this comes from a case, Georgia Pacific v. Stalin Brothers, that outlined 15 factors that we as damage experts consider in, in all cases involving reasonable royalties. I won't go through all 15, but as you can imagine, they do cover things that, that would be relevant to negotiating a license such as the scope and the length of the agreement, uh, the alleged use of the patented invention, whether it was to increase sales, reduce costs, um, whether there were alternatives uh, at the time of the hypothetical negotiation to using the patents, um, whether the parties are competitors, and most importantly, um, what's, what profit is generated from the uh, accused products, but more importantly, what portion of that profit uh, would be attributed to the alleged use of the patents or apportionment. So the last item that uh, we that I, I wanna cover in terms of the Georgia Pacific factors are license agreements. And if we can go to the next slide, Manuel. Um, the, a license agreement can actually be a good way of apportioning value to the patented invention. So for example, if, if the actual uh, patent in suit was licensed either prior to or even subsequent to the hypothetical negotiation, that can provide some relevant insight as to the value that can be attributed uh, to the use of the patent in the, in the instant um, uh, uh, dispute. Um, so there are rules though that go along with using uh, those types of agreements. And also even if it doesn't, an agreement doesn't include the patented invention or the patent in suit, um, you can use agreements that cover technology that is deemed to be comparable in cer certain regards. So if a technical expert indicates that another license agreement that covers a patent 
that is very similar te technologically to the patent in suit, that's, that may be a license to, to be considered. And then it's up to the economic expert to assess the economic comparability and adjust accordingly. At the end of the day, the goal is to apportion value and apportion value for the alleged use uh, of the patented invention. The one last point I'll make is that in, in, the, in the context of patent damages, there is a concept called the entire market value rule, which indicates that if the patented feature uh, does not drive demand for the product, there's an obligation to apportion. Uh, one way of apportioning is to perhaps adjust the royalty base. So for example, if, if your royalty is based on a percentage of sales, you may adjust that selling price down to a certain portion that covers only the patented element uh, to accomplish apportionment. Um, however, in the case of license agreements, if patents in suit have been licensed in a particular way, say as a percentage of the entire selling price, even though apportion, apportionment is appropriate, the concept here would be that the apportionment is built in in the royalty rate, and therefore there isn't a need to apportion the base. So again, apportionment can be done in many different ways. The goal is to get to the value attributed to the patent and feature, and license agreements can be a, a, a very useful way of, of getting there. Thanks, Vince. So the first trend that we're discussing today is the challenges experts face when conducting the comparability and apportionment analysis as part of a reasonable royalty uh, analysis. Uh, the general trend that we're seeing is that the federal circuit is cracking down on comparability and apportionment. Uh, the court is becoming stricter with this analysis. And we're gonna look at three recent decisions showing this trend. Uh, in Apple v. Weiland, Apple sued Weiland for declaratory judgment of non-infringement. Uh, then Weiland counterclaimed with its own infringement claims and sought damages. Uh, the procedural history of this case is, is somewhat long, but I want to give you some highlights because they really show that the Federal Circuit is not shy about remanding a case for a new damages trial multiple times. Uh, at the first trial, the jury returned a verdict of $145 million in Weiland's favor. Apple moved for a new damages trial or for a reduction in damages. Uh, the district court granted Apple's motion and gave Weiland the option of a damages award of $10 million or a new trial. Uh, Weiland chose to have a new trial. At the second damages trial, the jury then returned a verdict of $85 million in Weiland's favor. Apple again moved for a new damages trial, arguing that Weiland's expert had not had failed to apportion the comparable license. Uh, the district court denied Apple's motion, then Apple appealed, and the federal circuit reversed. So this case is now headed for its third damages trial. Um, so where did Weiland's expert go wrong here? Uh, the expert reviewed 150 agreements and chose to rely on three of them, which he determined to be comparable. Uh, the three agreements included licenses to the patents in suit, as well as other non-assertive patents. And the Federal Circuit found that the expert opinion was unreliable and untethered to the facts of the case. Uh, while the expert tried to adjust for the differences in the comparable license, he failed to account for the inclusion of the non-assertive patents. Specifically, the court found that the expert had failed to apportion uh, the royalty solely to the assertive patents. Uh, the court was also troubled by the fact that the expert had opined without any support that the patents in suit were key and that the non-assertive patents were included to give the licensee some sense of assurance. Uh, the court noted that two of the three license agreements, the patents in suit were not even discussed during the negotiation. So there was no evidence that the patents were key to those licenses. Um, let's take a look at another decision, a recent decision from the Federal Circuit that took a similar approach in the analysis of comparability and apportionment. Uh, in MLC v. Micron, MLC sued Micron for patent infringement. Uh, after expert discovery, Micron filed a dollar motion seeking to exclude MLC's damages expert as unreliable for failure to apportion. Uh, the district court granted Micron's motion. Uh, in response, MLC sought interlocutory review. On appeal, the Federal Circuit affirmed the district court exclusion. So where did MLC's expert uh, go wrong here? 
Uh, the expert looked at two agreements, the Hynix and the Toshiba agreements, and he determined that those were the most relevant and that no apportionment was necessary because the licenses were comparable in his view. Uh, the Federal Circuit disagree. Uh, the court found that the expert's analysis was flawed because it failed to apportion the value of the patented technology versus the unpatented features. Uh, for example, the Hynix agreement uh, granted a license to a portfolio of 41 US and international patents. And only one of those 41 patents was the issue in the hypothetical negotiation. Uh, the court also found that the expert conducted no assessment of the licensed technology versus the accused technology to account for any differences. Um, another recent decision from the Seattle Circuit showing that the court is becoming stricter with the comparability and apportionment analysis uh, came from the case of Omega v. Calam. Uh, in this case, uh, Omega sued Calam for infringement. At the first trial, Omega prevailed in some claims, but the Federal Circuit reversed in part and remanded the case for a new trial. At the second trial, uh, the jury found the infringement of some claims and awarded a royalty of $5 per unit. Uh, Calam then moved for a new damages trial, which the district court denied. And then on appeal, the Federal Circuit reversed an order a new damages trial. Uh, so where did Omega's expert go wrong? Well, the expert relied on 18 licenses that generally carry a royalty rate of $5 per unit. But instead of conducting an apportionment analysis, uh, the expert opined that no such analysis was necessary because apportionment was built in. Uh, the Federal Circuit disagree. Uh, the court found that the expert failed to show how the, that it patent features drove the demand for the entire accused product. Uh, the court found that it was undisputed that the accused product had conventional features that are not inventive aspects of the patents in suit. So merely recognizing that there are differences without accounting for them is not enough. Uh, the court also found that the expert uh, failed to show the incremental value that the patent features added to the accused product separate from the value of the unpatented features. Um, the court was also troubled by Omega's policy of licensing its technology for a royalty of $5 per unit, no matter how many patents are licensed in the company portfolio. The court found this to be particularly problematic because eight of the 18 licenses relied on by the expert involved numerous patents that were not involved in the case. Uh, a common thread uh, running through the cases uh, that we have been seeing is that experts run afoul of the comparability and apportionment analysis when they fail to develop a factual record and perform an analysis that identifies and accounts for the differences between the patent features and the unpatented features. Uh, with this in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Vince to hear from him about best practices uh, parties can employ to meet the comparability and apportionment requirements. Uh, thanks, Manuel. So first, we're going to talk about uh, some documents that are perhaps can be useful in that regard. Um, and so, first of all, when assessing the Georgia Pacific factors, one of the elements that you need to look at is a company's licensing policy. So it's typically something that we we do look to the way in which a company will assess its portfolio, whether they license regularly, what process they go through in licensing their technology. Uh, that can be really helpful, not only uh, from a Georgia Pacific perspective, but also in assessing comparability of certain licenses relative to their policy. Um, the other thing is we'll obviously want to request all license agreements uh, that may uh, that either cover the patents in suit or, or cover something that may be comparative. Um, but maybe what could be even more important could be documents or communications reflecting the underlying negotiations for those agreements. So as Manuel uh, alluded to, um, a patent license may include an entire portfolio. Um, the, the issue could be that only one of those patents in the portfolio, for example, may be at issue in the litigation. Um, understanding in the negotiations for those prior licenses, whether that patent or other patents in suit were actually discussed during the negotiations whether they were viewed as important in certain respects um, can be helpful or whether they weren't um, could be helpful as well. Um, also financial modeling that is done in, in, the, 
in connection with those uh, uh, prior licenses. Um, for example, I've seen situations where a license may include very few units at a particular rate that parties agreed to, and then the plaintiff will attempt to use that license and apply it to, say, millions of units. Um, the, the, the issue there is whether that rate is really appropriate given the difference in the volume that's at issue and the financial modeling that was performed to, to arrive at the, the, the rate that's in the license agreement or lack thereof could be uh, to some extent very compelling. Um, any documents that reflect how customers view uh, the feature that's covered by the patent certainly is helpful, as well as consumer surveys that may have been performed uh, by the plaintiff or excuse me, plaintiff or defendant uh, relative to uh, features that are covered by the patents. Um, as well as marketing documents that reflect uh, the overall value uh, of the features compared to other features within the product. And then lastly, uh, any sort of financial information, whether it's sales, profitability, or financial projections, is certainly something that we consider at the outset. And I think it's, it's helpful to get uh, damage experts involved early to, to request this type of information. Uh, Manuel, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the other thing that is very helpful uh, from our perspective as damage experts is to get information from either uh, witnesses for the client that I'm working with uh, or witnesses from um, the opposing uh, party through a 30B6 deposition. So if there are witnesses that have been involved in license negotiations uh, and in particular negotiations that have involved specific licenses that are at issue in the case, um, it's certainly helpful to either speak with those individuals or to draft questions to assist uh, uh, counsel in uh, getting information about those negotiations. And not only is it helpful to better understand those negotiations, but that can lead to other information that may be able to be discovered as part of the process. The other thing I would point out is that typically in, in all cases that I work on, we're going to talk to somebody that's involved from a financial perspective uh, or wanna have a 30B6 uh, deposition um, to understand the financials, to understand the profitability of the products at issue. The same with marketing, uh, how the products are marketed, um, how the patented features are marketed. And then lastly, we're gonna to wanna to obviously talk with the technical expert uh, because part of the process of, of assessing uh, comparability of licenses is whether there is technical technical comparability, and we'll want to understand from that witness how the, the, uh, the patents uh, will compare, technically speaking, to, to agreements that, that we're going to use that don't cover the patents in suit. And again, it's, I think it's helpful to get us involved early to be able to, to assess that information, to be able to ask questions that ultimately could lead to additional documents that will be discovered. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Manuel. Um, so again, in terms of using prior um, license agreements, uh, it really is case specific. Um, certain agreements that even cover the patents in suit very well may not be comparative uh, or with the information that's provided may not be able to be comparative. Um, one thing I will point out uh, from a technological perspective, we as damage experts rely on the technical experts to tell us whether certain patents and license agreements are in fact technologically comparable. Uh, in years past, typically that was it was sufficient to discuss that with the technical expert, and there may be a footnote in the, the expert's report relative to that issue. Uh, now I think it's very important that the technical expert actually uh, disclose the opinions relative to comparability, and we've even gone so far as to actually engage additional technical experts just on the issue of license comparability, because courts are, are taking a much closer look at that uh, in terms of whether those license agreements can actually be used. And then from there, once we've uh, assessed that it's technologically comparable, we're certainly gonna wanna understand the, the economic similarities and differences of those agreements. Um, for example, does the agreement contain, uh, the comparative agreement contain other technology other than the patent or patents in suit? And as you could tell from the cases that Manuel pointed out, in many of those cases, the comparative agreements were portfolio licenses where courts concluded that the expert had not adjusted accordingly 
for other technology in those agreements uh, that may not have been at issue in the case. Um, the other thing that I think is important to consider is the volume uh, that is related to the particular comparative license. Again, if, if you have a license agreement that's very narrow, it's maybe for a, a very few number of units uh, at issue, and it, uh, it, it, it may be something that uh, is going to be used in another context, that may very well be appropriate. It's just important to understand the relevance, whether there's testimony to that effect uh, or other information what, that would help support that. And then lastly, um, just from a guiding principle perspective, I, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of getting the technical expert involved and getting uh, the technical expert or experts involved early uh, to make sure that you've nailed down the technical comparability issue. And ultimately, the goal is to apportion value. Uh, license agreements can be a very uh, useful way of apportioning value. Uh, but ultimately, once you've arrived at the technological comparability, the goal then is to assess economic differences. And there can be, you know, certainly economic differences between the hypothetical negotiation uh, and the comparative agreements. Uh, and so long as those are acknowledged in some, in some ways accounted for, uh, then it certainly can be appropriate to use those, use those agreements as well. The next topic that we're discussing is the availability of uh, patent damages for foreign activity. Uh, courts presume that federal laws apply only within the territorial jurisdiction of the U.S. Uh, in the case of Western Gecko Bay Geophysical, the Supreme Court created an exception to this presumption in the context of foreign sales of infringing products. Uh, Western Gecko owns patents relating to a system for surveying the ocean floor and Geophysical was a competing company. Uh, they sold a system uh, that competed with Western Gecko system and Geophysical manufactured the components in the US and then shipped them to companies abroad. Uh, the companies then combined the components to create a service system that was indistinguishable from Western Gecko system. Uh, Western Gecko sued Geophysical for infringement. Uh, the jury found infringement and awarded damages which the district court upheld, but the federal circuit reversed. Uh, the issue before the Supreme Court was whether Western Gecko could recover lost profits for foreign sales under Section 271 F2. Uh, the court began its analysis by looking at Section 284. Uh, this section, like Vince uh, mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, is uh, the section that provides the damages available for infringement. Uh, the court concluded that the focus of Section 284 is infringement. Uh, the court then looked at Section 271 F2, uh, the basis for Western Gecko's infringement claim. And Section 271 F2 regulates the domestic act of exporting components from the U.S. Uh, because the co conduct that Western Gecko alleged gave rise to infringement was the exportation from the U.S. by geophysical the court held that Western Gecko could recover lost profits under Section 271 F2. Uh, because the court limited its analysis to Section 271 F2 and lost profits, it wasn't clear whether the court's analysis would apply to other infringement provisions and to reasonable royalties. Given the narrow focus of the Western Gecko decision, uh, we looked at recent decisions to see if there are any trends regarding how courts treat uh, patent damages for foreign activity. And recent cases show that there's a growing trend toward allowing recovery of patent damages for foreign conduct. At least three different district courts have expanded the scope of Western Gecko. Uh, one of these decisions came from Josh Noriega in the District of Delaware. In their Archer DX v. Curigen case, the patent holder asserted infringement under Section 271A. Uh, this section is the general infringement provision, and the patent holder sought both lost profits and reasonable royalties. Uh, the parties had a dispute over the jury's instruction whether the jury instruction should include damages for foreign sales. And the court here described the dispute as whether sales to foreign users of products that use the patent methods can be used to measure damages 
for acts of infringement in the U.S. And the court said yes, as long as the infringement in the U.S. was a substantial cost of the sale of the product and the accused infringer made or sold the product within the U.S. I know the decisions showing the growing trend towards allowing recovery of patent damages for foreign conduct is Centripetal v. Cisco from the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, in Centripetal, uh, the accused infringer lost a trial. Uh, at a damages hearing, the accused infringer produced sales data separating sales in the U.S. from overseas uh, in an effort to reduce the royalty base. Uh, the court awarded damages based on worldwide sales infringement under Section 271A. Uh, in response, the accused infringer moved for a new damages trial, and the court denied the motion, finding that the rationale of Western Gecko, which was based on Section 271F2, apply equally to Section 271A. Uh, the court found that because the undisputed evidence showed that the accused products were made, used, and or sold in the U.S., patent damages for wearable sales was proper. Was proper. Uh, a decision from the Eastern District of Texas reached the same conclusion as the centripetal case that we just saw. Uh, in Plastronics B1, the accused infringer moved for summary judgment that the patent holder cannot recover patent damages under Section 271A for foreign sales. Uh, the court denied the motion because it found that the rationale of Western Gecko apply equally to Section 271F2 as it does to Section 271A. Uh, in, this, in the court's view, the relevant inquiry is whether the infringement occurs in the U.S. In this regard, the court found that the patent holder had provided evidence that the accused infringer imported infringing products into the U.S. for their subsequent sale abroad. Uh, given these recent legal developments, let's turn to Vince to hear about his views on what are some best practices for the analysis of patent damages for foreign activity. Yeah, so um, in, in a lot of cases, we'll, we'll be asked to gather information re relative to, to foreign activity. Um, so uh, typically, we're going to want to get sales of products that were made in the U.S. and sold abroad. Um, we're, we're also going to want to understand if, if perhaps a product, as it was uh, imported for whatever reason uh, through the U.S. and ultimately made it to an international customer, uh, so, sort of the supply chain in that regard to understand whether those sales also would be subject uh, to damages uh, in the U.S. Um, also, um, if from a lost profits perspective, if uh, the domestic customer made a, a, a sale uh, to the customer, to the infringer made a sale to the customer of a patent holder that somehow impacted the, the patent holder's foreign sales, that's something obviously we would want to better understand and whether that's something that could be considered from a lost profits perspective. Uh, and then in terms of just the importance, um, there could be different things to look at if there are some components of the accused products and things of that nature. Um, that's something to consider as well. The one one thing I'll point out also is that we're we're typically asked to assess uh, sales of products where a component uh, is at issue. Say it's a chipset, and it's manufactured outside the U.S. and then sold to a third party outside the U.S., who then implements it into their product and then sells it back into the U.S. Um, obviously, that can be difficult to track. Uh, in that those sales are typically or can be accused. Um, and so to the extent that uh, you can discover uh, from the defendant if there is any mechanism or method by which they might track their products um, that are sold and whether they and whether and how they might make it into the US, that can be a better method than actually trying to estimate, which is typically what we're left with. Um, so that's something also to consider uh, from a discovery perspective as well. Thanks, Vince. So the next topic that we're discussing is whether expert may rely on licenses postdating the hypothetical negotiation in the reasonable royalty analysis. And reliance on information generated after the hypothetical negotiation falls under the Book of Wisdom doctrine. 
And Vince alluded to this earlier when he was giving us some background information on patent damages. So Vince, can you explain to us what is the Book of Wisdom doctrine? Sure. So as I pointed out, in, in an actual negotiation, um, you're not going to know what's going to happen thereafter. So those are facts that um, you, you typically obviously would not be able to consider. Uh, but in a hypothetical negotiation, as I said, all cards are on the table. So actual information as of that date for, from both parties is to be considered, but also information uh, or events that occur subsequent to the hypothetical negotiation can also be considered. And the idea behind this is that ultimately the goal is to assess the value attributed to the alleged use of the technology. And those events that occur after the hypothetical negotiation can be indicative of that value and consistent with what the parties known or would have reasonably known at the time of the hypothetical negotiation. So for example, uh, if subsequent to the negotiation, uh, there are license agreements that are entered into with other parties for the patented technology, that can certainly be a, a fact or factor that's relevant to assessing value or assessing apportionment. Um, if, for example, uh, parties were able to uh, come up with an alternative design and that it's pretty clear that that alternative design would have been available to the alleged infringer at the time of, of the uh, hypothetical negotiation, that's certainly an event that, that certainly can be considered. Um, and then also, in just in terms of the, the use of the, of the technology, there may be an expectation as of the time of the hypothetical negotiation that, that it may be used in a particular way. But when you're actually assessing value to the actual sales, perhaps the technology may have been used in a much different way that can be indicative of that value. In fact, I've had instances where a certain feature was um, covered by a patent and was going to be included in a product that they thought would be successful and, and important. And ultimately what they found out is that customers really were not as interested in that feature. And in fact, in, in some cases actually turned it off. So I think that, that those are relevant facts that weigh in on ultimately the goal, which is to assess uh, the value attributed uh, to the alleged use of the technology. So does the Book of Wisdom Doctrine extend to licenses post-dating the hypothetical negotiation? Uh, the Federal Circuit considered this question uh, in the case of Active Video v. Verizon. Uh, in that case, Active Video sued Verizon for patent infringement and then Verizon counterclaimed with its own infringement claims. Uh, at the trial, the jury found that the parties infringe each other's patents. And then Verizon moved for a new damages trial because the court prevented Verizon from relying on a certain agreement called the Cablevision Agreement. And this license postdated the hypothetical negotiation by four years. Uh, Verizon argued that this was an error because the court had permitted Active Video to rely on a different agreement, the Genstar Agreement, which postdated the negotiation by two years. So Verizon thought that the court was taking an inconsistent position in allowing parties to rely on these, uh, one party to rely on an agreement that postdated the hypothetical negotiation, but the other could not. Uh, the Federal Circuit found that the district court had a legitimate reason to exclude the cable vision agreement because it postdated the hypothetical negotiation by four years. Uh, the court thought that it was irrelevant that the district court had allowed Activision to activate it to rely on the Genstar agreement because Verizon had not challenged its admissibility. So this suggests this decision suggests that the Book of Wisdom doctrine may not apply to licenses postdating the hypothetical negotiation. However, uh, there is, despite the active video decision, there's recent legal support for relying on licenses postdating the hypothetical negotiation. And that support comes from the case of Willis v. Poly Group uh, from the District of Minnesota. Uh, the accused infringer's damages expert rely on a license that postdated the hypothetical negotiation by six years. And the patent holder moved to exclude her testimony as unreliable. But the court denied the patent holder's motion based on three aspects of the expert's opinion. Uh, and Vince has already touched on some of these. Uh, the first aspect is that the expert tied the late agreement to the hypothetical negotiation by asserting that certain facts underlying that agreement would have been known and would have been relevant to the accused infringer during the hypothetical negotiation. Uh, the second aspect is that the expert 
opined that the late agreement was representative of the amount that the licensee would pay for a bare license to the patented technology as opposed to the unpatented features. And the final aspect is that the expert had reason that the accused infringer had the ability to implement a non-infringing design at the time of the hypothetical negotiation. And based on these opinions, the court concluded that the amount that the accused infringer would have paid at the time of the hypothetical negotiation would have been comparable to the amount paid as part of the late agreement to avoid the cost of a redesign. Uh, so Vince, what are some best practices for dealing with licenses uh, post-dating the hypothetical negotiation? Well, I, I think that um, ultimately uh, it comes down to a facts and circumstances situation, as you just pointed to in the most in the, in the last case you discussed. Uh, it does come down to uh, whether the parties in those post-negotiation licenses whether the facts and circumstances surrounding those negotiations are similar to what would have been accept, expected in the hypothetical negotiation. Are they similar parties? Um, if, if time, as time has gone on, has that changed the landscape of the market? Have non-infringing designs become available? Things of that nature. So it really is a, a more of a facts and circumstances situation, but ultimately it, it, it makes sense to tie those facts of the actual negotiation or actual license back to uh, the hypothetical negotiation and make sure that those facts are consistent. And if not, um, then adjust accordingly. So we wanna finish this webinar by looking ahead at upcoming legal developments that could affect issues related to damages in patent cases. So the last topic that we're discussing today is the upcoming amendments to Federal Rule of Evidence 702 and their potential impact. Uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 702 is a rule that sets the standard for admissibility of expert testimony. Uh, the Supreme Court addressed Rule 702 in the now infamous Daubert case. Uh, in Daubert, the court uh, found that Rule 702 replace the Fry standard being used by some courts, which was general acceptance in the field. And to clarify the standard, the court outlined factors to consider when deciding expert admissibility. And we list the factors in this slide, and you probably have seen them many times. Uh, in response to Daubert and the cases interpreting the Daubert decision, Rule 702 was amended in 2000 to reflect the revised admissibility standard. After the 2000 amendments, concerns began to arise that the federal courts were being inconsistent in their application of Rule 702. Uh, those concerns led a judicial committee that works in evidence rules to spend four years analyzing how federal courts are interpreting and applying Rule 702. And the, study, the committee study confirmed that some federal courts are actually misapplying Rule 702. Uh, for example, some courts are applying a presumption of admissibility. And we see that in the Feliciano v. CoreLogic case from the Southern District of New York. In Feliciano, the court specifically mentioned a presumption of admissibility as a reason for admitting the challenge expert testimony. Uh, the Ninth Circuit took a similar approach in the Hatterman v. Monsanto case. However, both of these decisions run counter to the federal rules of evidence, which provide that the standard for admission is the preponderance of the evidence. Uh, rule 702 uh, was enacted to give courts a gatekeeping role in admitting expert testimony. Uh, the committee that studied how federal rules are applying seven, rule 702 found that some courts are interpreting the rule in a way that is foregoing the court's gatekeeping role. Uh, in the report, the committee noted that some courts are treating questions relating to the sufficiency of an expert's basis and the application of the expert's methodology as questions of weight and not admissibility. But the committee found that this was an incorrect application of Rule 702 and 401A. Uh, one example of this incorrect application is the Fifth Circuit decision in US v. Hodge. In Hodge, the court held that questions relating to the basis and sources of an expert's opinion go to the weight and not to the admissibility of the opinion. The concerns about the inconsistent application of Rule 702 
led the committee to propose two amendments. And in this slide, we were showing the proposed amendments. Uh, the new material is underlined in red and the text to be deleted is lined through. Uh, the first proposed amendment clarifies that the burden of proof is more likely than not. And this is, as we all know, the same as the preponderance of the evidence. Uh, the second proposed amendment requires the court to determine whether the expert's conclusion reflect a reliable application of the principles and methods to the fact of the case. So it's not enough that the expert use reliable principle and methods, the expert's opinion must actually reflect a reliable application of those principles and methods. Uh, if the Supreme Court approves the proposed amendments and Congress does not act, uh, the amendments will take effect on December 1st of this year. Uh, since this is a damages presentation, you may be wondering why are we talking about proposed amendments to Rule 702? Well, the reason that we're talking about these upcoming amendments is that district courts often decide Daubert motions on damages issues by relying on the weight of the evidence approach and pawn the issue to the jury. So this approach will likely not pass muster under the new rule. The proposed amendments to Rule 702 are significant. Uh, in reading when we're getting ready for this uh, webinar, I was reading at some blogs from uh, professors on evidence and some legal scholars have described them as the biggest change ever to the federal rules of evidence. Uh, in terms of their potential impact, parties should expect more aggressive challenges to expert opinions, including an increase in the number of rule 702 motions. Uh, based on the comments that the committee received, it appears that the plaintiff's bar is against the amendments as favoring the defense. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, the defense bar appears to be in support of them. Uh, parties should also expect that expert testimony will be subject to a higher admissibility standard uh, because the new rule will require courts to undertake a more substantive analysis. It is possible that courts will take more time to decide on rule 702 motions. So we're gonna switch now to best practices for dealing with the new rule. Uh, while the new rule uh, will likely not become effective until December 1st of this year, uh, the amendment concerning the burden of proof already applies. Uh, the rule amendment in this regard was just a clarification. So this means that the party should already cite to, to it in the rule 702 motions. Uh, the new rule could lead judges and courts to modify their practices and procedures for dealing with expert challenges. Therefore, the party should monitor those practices and procedures to know what's expected of them. Uh, the party should also consider whether to build in more time for expert reports. Additional time may help to ensure that the expert's conclusion uh, reflect a reliable application of the principle and methods to the fact of the case. Uh, and this is important when dealing with Rule 702 motions, the party should be careful about citing to case law that admitted expert testimony under the weight of the evidence approach. Uh, those cases may not be good law after the new rule comes into effect. Um, that being said, the party should also understand the limits of the new rule. Uh, some challenges to expert testimony will still raise matters of weight rather than admissibility. As an example, the committee noted in its support that if the court finds that it's more likely than not that an expert has a sufficient basis to support an opinion, the fact that the expert has not read every single study that exists may raise a question of weight and not admissibility. Outside of the motion practice, the party should consider whether it's beneficial to bring up issues of expert admissibility into settlement or mediation talks. Uh, this could be helpful in instances where an expert opinion is particularly vulnerable to a challenge under the new rule. The party should also think about the new rule when working with experts. Uh, given that the new rule has a higher admissibility standard, uh, the party should contact their experts sooner to provide them more time to develop their opinions. Uh, the experts should also understand the new requirements of Rule 702. Uh, they should know what is expected of them over and above the technical knowledge. Uh, the party should also work with the experts to ensure that the opinions reflect a reliable application of the principle and methods to the fact of the case. Uh, in preparation for the positions, 
the party should do mock cross-examinations to prepare their experts on how to respond to questions relating to potential admissibility challenges. And since we have an expert with us today, I think it would be good to conclude by getting his thoughts. So, so Vince, how would you prefer to be prepped about the upcoming rule change? Well, I guess, first of all, I would say that um, it's, it's my belief that I and my colleagues and experts that I have been adverse to, I think to a large extent will already meet these requirements and they have reliably applied uh, the facts of the case to, to principles and so on and so forth. There are situations where that's not the case. And I would expect um, uh, judges to become more involved, uh, and perhaps even hold hearings on this issue to gain a better understanding as to whether they're meeting uh, this new standard. Um, I would also say that what would be helpful uh, is um, maybe a better appreciation for the, the fact that as damage experts, and this is myself and colleagues and, and individuals in our market that um, we we can only do with what we have and the information that's available to us. So when we're requesting information or performing additional analysis, it's for this very purpose. And so just perhaps maybe a, a better acknowledgement or understanding that this is a critical element uh, to what we do. And the, the it doesn't help anybody to have an opinion that ultimately gets excluded. So these are things that we're doing to guard against that and just be being cognizant that that may take more time and effort, but there is a, a reason for that and a goal in mind. Um, and that ultimately, I think that the, you'll see in expert reports, um, even additional sections or uh, more commentary uh, on reasonable application as it's defined here, uh, or perhaps in the new standard, to, to point out just in fact how we are, are meeting that standard, or perhaps how you know opposing expert may not be meeting that standard, which again, again may, may take more time and effort on our part. So, uh, Manuel, one, one topic that uh, you and Vince touched upon at the very beginning is the apportionment topic. And I think one of the biggest changes that we've seen is as uh, Vince has laid out is really the need to rely on technical experts more fulsomely to deal with that apportionment. Uh, Vince, how, how do you approach dealing with technical experts? As you said in the past, we often would just have a conversation or put a reference in the technical expert report. Uh, but now that you're being put under the microscope more uh, diligently on apportionment, what is your, your most comfortable way of getting up to kind of speed or getting to the level where you think you can defend your position on apportionment from a tactical perspective? Yeah, so so typically as economic experts, we are relying on someone else for that opinion. So we want to make sure that, but, but if it doesn't uh, pass that threshold, uh, the economic comparability really should doesn't apply at that point. We haven't met that that first that first hurdle or that first burden. So we we'll want to understand um, from a layperson's perspective what the comparability issue is. But we'll also uh, we also encourage counsel to include uh, in the expert report a description and a basis uh, for that comparability, um, in large part because I think that's what courts are now expecting, as opposed to just a discussion with a technical expert or something that they may disclose uh, in a more limited basis in their report. So we encourage counsel to to approach it from that perspective. And also, um, you know, to whatever extent uh, the technical expert um, is maybe not qualified in that regard from a comparability standpoint, um, we've had situations where counsel has actually retained an additional expert specifically for that purpose to assess comparability. And I think that was certainly useful uh, as well, just to ensure we meet that hurdle so we can get to the economic comparability stage. And another point that you talked about um, in detail for comparability was oftentimes your licenses will cover more than the patents that are at issue. Uh, but in addition, how do you deal with when there's additional rights in a patent that may not be what would result from the hypothetical negotiation, be it maybe exclusivity or rights to sub licenses or just more um, ability to use the technology? Yeah, there, I mean, it, it really does depend on the facts and circumstances. I've had many situations where we've been able to, to make adjustments uh, for those factors 
um, in some fashion or form, uh, depending on what information would be available. So even though that exists, and even though you may have a portfolio, and even though you may have a license that's negotiated under different circumstances, um, there are ways that you can account for that and, and address those issues of comparability. Um, but the important point is to, to obviously to certainly recognize and, and, uh, and assess those differences. Well, Manuel and Vince, I think this has been very informative. We're, we're coming to the uh, end of the presentation. I think this concludes our webinar for today. We hope you found the information shared today was useful. Um, and we thank uh, Manuel and Vince for putting such a detailed presentation together and bringing us all up to speed on the recent developments uh, in this area. Thanks, Brian. And we have the information for our, our, our names and contact information. If you have any questions about any of the content that we presented, please feel free to reach out to us.